this cut through. Um, as, I, as I said, this is the first of a series of seminars and workshops that we're going to have. One of the things that uh, we like to do in our RAU program, I, mean, I think it's a good idea, and I believe in the strong too, but from a practical point of view, if we didn't plan to do these things, NSF would never fund us to do this. The core purpose of this is what you do in the lab with your faculty mentor, but the rest of it's kind of icing on the cake, and I think the icing is important too. It makes the cake taste a lot better. So we're going to do seminars on writing and speaking, um, ethics, uh, proper research techniques, um, and then we'll have seminars from various faculty about various technical areas and we're going to try to get us all on the same page because there, there is a, a common theme in, in the research you're doing, but it is kind of disparate and separate and it's uh, uh, good to have an idea, some understanding of all the different technologies and scientific theory that we're working with. So today's topic is called Research Techniques, Effective Practices, and, and Documentation. And this talk was put together by me, uh, Daniel Kutchall back there, uh, my graduate student. Uh, and we got input from the, some of the other uh, grad student postdoc mentors. And so a, a couple of caveats. This, the brainchild of this is really Daniel's back here. Two or three weeks ago, we were looking at uh, a lab notebook of one of the undergraduate students that I worked with over the last year. Uh, and, and the guy did good work, uh, but the, the lab notebook left somewhat to be desired. Some of the information was hard to read, some of it was unclear, and there's results and data in there that you know, probably would be difficult to repeat. It's not sure what he's, what he's doing. And I can't blame the student completely because I never really talked to him about how to keep a lab notebook. I said, here it is, write down everything. Um, and so I think the, the attitude he had was, this is notes for me. I'm going to write down what I did so tomorrow I can look at it and you know, remember what was going on. But really, a lab notebook is not just for you, it's for other people. In fact, it's, it's more for other people than it is for you. Because chances are somebody else is going to pick up where you left off. And so all my students give me the lab notebook when they leave, and oftentimes I'll hand it to another student and say, this is what's been done, you're going to build on that. Uh, and so it, it sort of came out of that idea. And so, you know, we really ought to uh, uh, have a, a workshop or a seminar on just practical ways to keep your lab notebook uh, practical ways to do research and so it kind of evolved out of this. So anyway, but today's plan or outline is the following. We're going to talk a little bit about motivation, which I've sort of already done, but why is it important? This is not the most exciting part of research, keeping good notes uh, and being careful of uh, experimental procedures and methods. It's kind of a boring part of it, but it, it's very important to do. Otherwise, everything you do becomes kind of useless. If you do great research and come up with a great idea, but you didn't document it and it can't be repeated and nobody can use it and you don't effectively communicate it, then what good is it? Um, also, we'll talk a little bit about safety and care of view and equipment. Notice I double underline and put in red view because you are more important than equipment. Yes, I have to say that whether I believe it or not. Really true. You are more important than equipment. We also want to take good care of the equipment talk about some ex, uh, effective experimental practice. These are general things. The, the specifics are going to be dependent on what work you're doing, what lab you're in. Talk about effective documentation. It's boring but crucial. You know, one of the things people hate to do is they develop a product or a company and then somebody has to write a user manual or write the documentation of it. Nobody wants to do that. Everybody hates it. And that's why sometimes user manuals are so poorly done because it's not a very exciting thing to do. You can ask Daniel if he, over the last few months, has been putting together sort of a, 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 a user manual of certain experimental techniques that we use in my lab a lot. It's not exciting stuff, but it's important because when he leaves, the rest of us and new students need to know how to do this and we don't want to read any more of the uh, Learning and critical thinking, you know, that's very much a part of research. Even you know, researchers don't know everything. A lot of research is, is understanding what other people have done, being an uh, expert in your field, and knowing something about peripheral fields that are, that are related to it. Then just some general guidelines. A lot of the grad student mentors and Daniel and all of us just brainstorm some ideas and sort of just put them together in a random list, and I tried to organize it 
uh, serve a list of tips. Then we'll look at some final considerations and we'll have some time for questions uh, and discussion. So a little bit of introduction and motivation. You know, the idea here is to illustrate and introduce uh, some of the ideas and techniques <coughs> and characteristics of good research practice. It's not exhaustive, it's just some of the main things. Um, they're not, as the second bullet says, these are not great revelations about research. They're just good standard practices to do things in an organized uh, way based on um, our experience. I'm sure there are people out there that uh, are faculty at universities that do research on research. It sounds kind of silly, but I guarantee you there's a body of literature out there on this topic, and I haven't consulted any of it. This is all from experience. Uh, but there probably uh, is a great body of literature on unaffected ways to do this. Just like there's, a, there's a, a body of literature on how to teach. There's a body of literature on how to write literature. There's a body of literature on how to search literature. There's a body of literature on everything you could ever imagine. And so there probably are some good standard practices out there that have been researched thoroughly um, that I may not be mentioning, but I think if you follow these basic guidelines, it will help. Again, it's not the most exciting part of research, but it's you know, second to nothing in importance. Because again, if you don't do these things effectively, even if you come up with something great in the lab, um, it's not going to be very beneficial. I remember a, a TV show I watched when I was a kid, and in this, you know, this was TV and science fiction, but some kid, sort of a geeky high school student, came up with just experimenting some great chemical formula for a very powerful rocket fuel. And if he accidentally set it off in, in the street in front of his house and you know, the cops came, and somehow the defense department found out about it and said, oh, this is a great rocket fuel. You know, we could use this. How did you make it? And he said, oh, I don't know. I just mixed a bunch of stuff together. And they spent forever trying to figure out what this kid did, not that they ever figured it out. But in any case, that was the whole idea. It wasn't well documented, and you wouldn't expect a high school student to know how to do that. But he came up with something great and was lost because nobody could figure out what it did. And he never wanted to do what it did. So. Uh, most of these techniques are generalized. Uh, specific techniques will vary between labs. Uh, although there is some coherence in what you guys are doing, you know, some of you are working with uh, very toxic and dangerous chemicals, and other people are, are making measurements and not using chemicals at all. And the practices and procedures may be different, but so trying to be generalized. And again, this is based on input from several of So let's start out with, with safety. Um, the first thing I want to do is go to the bottom two bullets. You know, this is not a safety training seminar. Uh, that's not something I have great expertise in. Um, so you need to complete safety training as appropriate to your mentor. Some of you have already done that. Some of you, uh, at least only one person did it before she even came. Uh, and it's very important in the lab that this student's working with. The safety training necessary in my lab is, uh, you know, be careful and don't drop a piece of equipment on your feet. Um, the, the, the worst thing that could happen is if you're not careful, you might have some very high voltages across the terminals of a piece of equipment, but most of the things we're looking at are a few volts and milliamps, microamps, nanoamps. So there's not a lot of safety issues in my lab. Uh, in other labs, it's very, very crucial. So I'm gonna give you some generalizations that people have sent me to think about and put together here. So keep in mind, safety is very, very important. It's the most important aspect of anything you can carry because if you hurt yourself or kill yourself or hurt someone else, uh, you're not doing anybody to good and you're really detrimental. So that should be obvious. Uh, so again, this is just some basics. Protocols in your lab are going to be very different. Um, you go from one lab to the other. Even if they do similar things, they're going to have different rules. But here are some you know, appropriate things. Always use appropriate appropriate PPE, personal protective equipment. You may not have any. There isn't any in my lab. Max, you're not going to have to worry about this. Just make sure you're going to let you keep yourself. Um, and that's not likely because you're going to be measuring uh, currents going through dielectrics and you'll be lucky if it gets up to the micro amp range. Um, but you, have, you should be familiar with what that is in the lab. And the person that sent this recommendation is somebody that works with a lot of potentially dangerous materials and chemicals. I probably wouldn't have thought to say this, uh, but, but I've had to use this myself. So you know, things like gloves, glasses, lab coats, um, you know, it depends on the protocols in your lab, so don't be careless about this. And another, another example I'll give is um, 
Again, in my lab, there's not anything that dangerous. The worst you have to work for about maybe it's possibly high voltage, and that's kind of rare. But down the hall from my, my, off my lab, we used to have a clean room. Now it's sort of in another building. But going into that lab, which a lot of my students do and I do, is completely different. There are chemicals in there that will kill you if you're not careful. And so we were very, very meticulous about what we did in that lab. You can be a little carefree in my lab. In that lab, if you're carefree, uh, some very, very bad things will happen. And we have a, um, a research associate whose whole job was to run that lab, and you couldn't go in the door unless you had extensive training, um, and you had to have practical and written exams and pass them, or you couldn't go in the room. That's how dangerous it was. Nobody ever got hurt. Uh, so it, it just depends on what you're doing. So you need to know all the safety features in your lab. Um, read. I didn't define this, but anybody in here know what an MSDS sheet is? Something in the sheet. All right, well you, you probably learned that in your, your safety training. It's okay. uh, something that some of you will get very, very familiar with. And in, in the clean room I worked in, we had a set of MSDS sheets that was that thick, you know, two notebooks that thick. It stands for Material Safety Data Sheets. And basically what it is, if you're using a particular chemical, it's something simple like isopropanol, which is a fancy way of saying rubbing alcohol. There's an MSDS sheet on that that's probably several sheets that tells you everything you could possibly ever want to know about this chemical, especially the hazards and the dangers and the proper use and, and all that. And so if you're in a lab that deals with, that has these chemicals, it's federal law that there's got to be MSDS sheets there uh, easily accessible and you're supposed to know about them. If you don't know about them, you know, somebody's uh, you know, breaking the law. So make sure you read those about the chemicals you're working with. Uh, if you're not sure about safety, stop and ask somebody. You know, some of these things are obvious, but sometimes people don't ask questions. They're, they're afraid that they should know or somebody will you know, think they're not you know, confident if they don't know something, but that's not true. I ask questions all the time, even things that I should have known 10 years ago. Better to ask than to make a mistake, whether it's safety for you or safety for the equipment. Um, this other bullet we, we modified just a little bit. It just said never work alone. Uh, that's not always true. I work alone all the time, but I'm in my office or I'm uh, in my lab making electrical measurements on very, very small, very, very low voltage things. But if you work with dangerous materials or in dangerous conditions, then never work alone. In the clean room, if someone was going into the lab, even the research associate that ran the lab and was an expert on all this, if he was going to go into the clean room and do something with dangerous chemicals, he would not do it unless if a faculty member or a student was in the general area. Because if a, there was a spill or there was an accident or he was injured, he could lay in there for hours and nobody would know. So if you're doing something like that, you know, don't work for uh, Again, it will be specific to your lab. Um, but in my lab, I have grad students that will go down there at night and make some measurements or you know, work on a paper or analyze data. And that's okay. There's dangers involved in being by yourself, as I was telling my, my you know, I could sit in my office at night, you know, grading exams and have a heart attack and there'd be nobody there to you know, resuscitate me, but you know, you, you, you've got to be practical. But certainly if you're working with something uh, dangerous, don't do it by yourself. That's probably not too relevant to you guys because there's, there's no way they're going to let you guys go into a lab and work with something hazardous without somebody looking over your shoulder. But just in general, once you become tenured professors at prestigious universities. Don't go in the lab and do stuff like this by yourself. There are pl plenty of horror stories that, uh, that I could tell you, especially Dr. Harris, the guy that ran his clinic, could tell you about you know, people dying because they didn't heed that morning. Uh, let others know that you're working with hazardous materials and equipment for two reasons. So they know to sort of look out for you in case something happens. And so they don't walk in on you and maybe endanger themselves and you. So communication is important. And again, this is not a safety training seminar. Uh, what I've told you on this slide is more like an introduction to safety training, but it, it just, I want to point out that it's important. And so you should learn about uh, the safety uh, protocols in your situation. Feel free to stop me anytime if you have a question. None of this is very deep, just some things you need to see. I'll, I'll send you a copy of, of, of this uh, PowerPoint slide. So, Notice this was safety and care of you, I underline you, this is just about you. Now this is safety and care of equipment. It, it's secondary in a sense because your life's more important than equipment. 
no matter how expensive it is, but this is important also. Uh, most of you will be working with materials and instruments and equipment that are, are very costly uh, and very sophisticated and very sensitive in some cases. And so you need to be very, very careful. Most of you probably will. It depends on your personality. I'm, I'm a very cautious person, probably a little bit too much. I don't push buttons until I know exactly what I'm doing. But I've worked with people who will go into a lab and, and not just students, you know, you know, other faculty and people with years of experience. And they just start pushing buttons because they just have to get started. Um, it, it's good to be very careful about what you're doing. So again, it's very costly, treated as if it were your own. In some ways it is. Um, not so much for you guys now, but when you go to grad school, if, uh, you know, if Daniel is not careful with the piece of equipment he's working on and he breaks it, that's bad for me, but it's also bad for him because his doctoral dissertation may be based on that, and now what are we going to do, what's he going to do? So it, it's uh, not just me, it's not just the university, it's going to affect you. Also, uh, be careful with samples, not just pieces of equipment. Um, you know, a sample might be something cheap and consumable and you can get a thousand of them for a dollar, but sometimes samples, of the, and, and samples is a very generic term, sometimes they can be very expensive, sometimes they can be very <coughs> time consuming and, and fabricated. As an example, in, in the work that we do, oftentimes we'll take a piece of semiconductor, silicon, silicon carbide, uh, whatever, go through days of processing, you know, chemical cleaning, growing dielectric, putting down metals, patterning things, annealing, it can take hours and hours. For example, to deposit a little slab of metal on a silicon wafer, uh, I just want to put a, a circle of aluminum on, you know, on top of a sample. The actual evaporation process itself probably lasts less than 60 seconds. But to get to that point takes four hours of preparation and pumping down the vacuum chamber for hours so it gets to a certain level. And, and you can spend half a day to do a 60 second process of putting the metal dot down. And that's maybe 20% of the process to get your sample made. So you spend days, other people help you, uh, and then you've got this sample already to go and make measurements and then you drop it and slip it off and break it, and you just wasted a week of time and some material. So it's, it's careful, it, it's important to be very, very meticulous. Um, not too surprised. Make sure you're adequately trained on equipment before you use it. I think most people realize that. Don't be afraid to ask for help or ask for questions. Um, you're just learning this. Uh, I've been working in this area for years, and I still sometimes forget things about my own equipment because I'm not down there eight hours every day. My grad students know how to use this stuff much better than me because they live there. Um, so if I want to make a measurement, sometimes I have to ask them, how do I do this again? I haven't done it for a year. Uh, so don't be afraid. Um, I, I sort of stole this one from the Boy Scouts. Both my sons have been involved in Scouts since first grade. Um, we, this, the, the Boy Scout motto is leave a campsite looking better than it was when you arrived. Well, same thing. Leave your equipment and instruments, the lab, the lab area you're working in, at least in the same state as you found them. Nothing is more annoying than to walk into a lab and use a piece of equipment and you just jump everywhere. It's not yours. You've got to clean it up, you've got to put it up got to worry, make sure that you're not throwing something away that's important, you know, just consider other people are going to be using this. So, uh, you know, let somebody know if you have problems with, with equipment. Um, and I put this little caveat, whether, whether you cause the problem or not, I mean, nobody's perfect. Even if there's a problem and you caused it because you made a mistake, that's okay. You're, you're learning. You know, I, I've messed up samples and probes and things. You know, myself. And, and I say this because I've had students that were so afraid to tell me that they made a mistake and screwed something up that they wouldn't tell me, and that just compounded the problem because eventually we're going to find out. Um, so, you know, if you've got a problem, just be sure and let people know. But sometimes it's a minor thing and they can fix it in a second. Um, don't be sloppy, careless, or disrespectful disrespectful to equipment to people. I've kind of already said that. It's obvious you shouldn't be disrespectful to people, but you shouldn't be disrespectful to equipment either. It's sensitive, it's complicated, other people have to use it. Um, look at this statement down here. This is this is fairly critical. It's something that I have to remember too. Um, uh, the work you're doing is important because it can ultimately affect your career. Maybe not as much this summer, 
but ultimately, you know, the idea is, is to prepare you for grad school and a research career. It could affect your career. It could affect my career if you're working for me, uh, or your colleagues' career, other students, your institution, because all this is connected. Um, you know, the, the ranking and prestige of the university is largely based on the quality and the effectiveness of research. If it doesn't go well because people aren't being careful, then a lot of people are, are affected. And also society, the ultimate reason, really, that we should be doing research at a, at a, at a university level is because of the, the benefit of society. A, a good definition for the, for the purpose of a university is, let me see if I can remember this, the purpose of a university is the acquisition, generation, dissemination, and application of knowledge in order to improve the human condition. So that's kind of a lofty thing to say, but if you think about what's done in university, that encompasses everything. I've never been able to find an exception to that. So ultimately, we're trying to make society a better place. Even if you're sitting doing some tedious experiment, you've got to do 100 measurements, and you feel like it's going to be years before anything useful comes of it, that's just the way science is. But ultimately, it affects all of society, so you should take it very, very seriously. Okay, so uh, enough of a, uh, equipment safety and people safety. Yeah, any questions or anything? I don't want to just talk for an hour or you and comments or questions. If you think of anything, you know, you give me some input, because there, there are going to be things that I'm not going to mention, because uh, this is not exhaustive. Plus the fact we started working on this about a week ago, so it's a uh, really had a lot of time to think about it. Okay, we thought we would you know, add some ideas on some on general aspects of you know, effective experimental practice. Again, generalize things. And some of this is repetitive, and that's okay. You know, keep your work space organized, clean, and clutter free. Um, again, it's kind of my nature to do that anyway. It's not everyone's nature to do that, but it, it's really important to do so because, again, if you've got junk all over the place, your, your lab space, your desktop, whatever it is, your lab bench is messy and there's stuff all over, um, and you don't have all the materials you need, you're going to be less efficient at, at best and maybe even you know, cause accidents or have poor results. Um, contamination spills, you know, breaking that sample that you spent a week, fertilization. Uh, you, you can't always do that, but, but have as much as possible. Um, if you need to move an instrument or move some books or notebooks or something to give you some space to work, then uh, let's see what's next. Yeah, we're gonna show some examples. Then do so. But I have to say, add the caveat: if you don't always have that luxury, and there's only so much lab space and only so much lab bench space, and but at least try to shoot for that ideal. Um, otherwise, as you can see, there's all kinds of things that can happen. It can jeopardize your safety. It can jeopardize you know, safety of equipment and and also your results. It's just best to be in order of the way. Uh, before beginning an experiment, have everything, get everything together, get everything ready. You know, people will tell you if you're going to study as a student you know, for an exam, you know, get all your materials together, clear off the space, find a nice quiet area, you have all your pencils and calculators and books and notes and whatever you need in front of you and ready to go and then start studying. If you just sort of grab stuff and do it uh, happenstance, you're not going to uh, study as effectively and efficiently. There have been again, scientific studies to prove this, plus it's common sense. The same thing really works in anything you're going to do that has any complexity at all. So before you start, make sure plan, make sure you have everything uh, together. You know, nobody always does these things perfectly. I don't either. And every time I violate that principle, most of the time I end up having to start and stop five or six times before I get going. So again, follow instructions and never rush. Uh, this is a good one that came from one of our uh, mentor, uh, grad student mentors. You know, science can't be rushed or forced. You've got to take your time. You've got to be meticulous. Um, uh, an example of how that could cause conflict is I used to work with a guy before I came to Clemson. Fortunately, I didn't work with him very much. But he was, he was a very, what you call, seat of your pants type of guy. If we were going to go in the lab and do something, he'd want to walk into the lab and just, just start. You know, and I said, wait, wait, what exactly are we going to do? We're going to make measurements on what? Well, and he never thought about what he was going to do. I, on the other hand, wanted to be very meticulous and plan and careful and have everything out there. I saw him as reckless. He saw me 
as uh, a procrastinator and you know, overly picky and wasting time because I wanted to spend 15 minutes thinking about what we were going to do before we did it. And, you, know, you can take it to the extremes. Uh, just you have to find the happy medium that works for you. So here's some examples. I won't say whose lab this is, but here's some examples of, of uh, you know, just to, to visualize what we're talking about. But this is an example of some cluttered lab space. Now, if you look at this picture, this doesn't look too bad. I mean, everything's sort of nice and neat and organized, but there's no workspace. Uh, if I wanted to sit down here and use this instrument or use that instrument and make some measurements and take some notes, it's like, where am I going to sit my samples? Where am I going to put my notebook? Where am I going to put my calculator? There's, there's just not much space there. So if I'm going to spend a whole lot of time here, I'll probably want to reorganize this and move a few things. Uh, I look at this lab space. That looks very, very cluttered. If you look closely, you know, look at this lab area. There's, there's junk under here. You can't even set the table and stick your feet under it. There's just stuff everywhere. I see this and I see clutter. Now, you can probably figure it out whose lab this is. It's mine. Um, and this we kind of made messy to illustrate. This, this is really the way this looks. Now, if I was doing this work, I would set it up in a little bit neater fashion, but the you know, effective work is going on here. And part of it is there's limited space and a lot of equipment, and we have limited options in improving this. But at least, if you were going to work here for a long time, you probably ought to try to figure out a way to make it a little bit less disorganized. Um, so here's an example, you know, some ideal examples. You look at, at this example, now here I've got equipment set fairly well organized, and there's some instruments laying there, laid out nice and ready to go. And there's some space to set, put a notebook, uh, you can put a laptop if I need to, uh, and have some room to think about what I'm doing. This also looks neat, um, but it's not what I would call ideal because there's still a limited workspace. But there's not much I can do here. All these instruments are needed, and that lab bench is as big as it is, and there's not a lot I can do about it. Uh, but at least, you know, you try to shoot for the best depending on what your lab uh, conditions are. But at least these, these two spaces are a lot more efficiently set up than, than the other. Okay, a few more general things, um, sort of based on the hodgepodge of input. Um, one thing you should always do, and, and this is relevant to the colleague of mine that I called seat of the pants kind of guy. Make sure you know what you're trying to accomplish before you begin anything. Uh, you know, certainly begin an experiment, but really before you do anything that has any complexity to it. There's more than one step. Think about what you're doing. Um, it's easy to just, you know, you've got a, a new sample, a new device, and I know the feeling I'm the same way. I want to just go in and make a measurement on it and see if it works and see what it looks like. But you need to be very careful and think about what, what you're trying to do. I stole this comment, this was Daniel's idea, it's a great idea, I've forgotten about it. What is the goal? This is the, the, the life creed of Dr. Harris, the guy at Eastern Illinois Cleanery, and he still works with us. All over the labs he works in, he's got these little signs, what is the goal? And that evolved from students and even faculty, you know, walking up to me, he, he asked me this all the time, I said, Jim, can you make me some samples of, the, has this material on, that material on, they're about this size and this many? And he said, well, yeah, but what, what, what is it you want to do? Oh, I want to, I want to make some measurements on it. He said, what's the goal? What are you really trying to do? Because it's going to affect what he does and how he does it. And a lot of times when I tell him what I really want, he'll say, well, you know what you really need to do is this. And, and it turns out better. So always think about why are you doing this? Um, there will be times when you may not need to ask that question because your faculty mentor may tell you exactly what to do. But at some point, you're going to be running free with it, hopefully during this REU experience, but certainly when you go to grad school, uh, you're, you're going to be doing that. I don't tell Daniel every day what to do. I don't say, go downstairs and make this sample, make this measurement, and plot this graph, and do this calculation, and give me the results. I give him general goals because you know, he's, uh, it, it's his project, too. Um, some other things, this is, I think, relevant to what you're doing now. You're going to have a lot of guidance in these things, but, but in general, 
you know, do a thorough literature search on your proposed project or research, whatever you're doing, before you start working. And there are some obvious reasons. You don't want to spend six months working on something that's already been done. And you can read two papers and see there's the results. And then the idea is you build on that. Or maybe uh, somebody else has already tried this and it doesn't lead anywhere. So, uh, you know, that's one obvious thing. But, but also, you need to be thoroughly versed uh, in the topic that you're researching. So this literature search is not a one-time thing. It's a continuous thing that you'll, you should start now and you can stop when you retire and go to the you know, retirement complex. Uh, it never, ever stops. Um, and there's never, ever enough. I never feel like that I do enough uh, study of the literature because things happen so fast. Uh, so much stuff gets published so quickly, it's almost impossible to keep up with. Uh, and that's in one little narrow area. So it's, it's very important to, to keep abreast of what's going on. And it also gives you ideas. I mean, you read a paper or a couple of papers that some group's working on somewhere else that's related to what you're doing, and, and their results may give you some insight or, or ideas about what you're doing, so it's very important to do. And, and I'm sure most of your faculty mentors are going to give you something to read. Um, Max and Nathan asked me for some things to read the other day, and I probably was sent them in many, many megabytes of files, uh, more than the one that I think they would have asked me. But that's even just scratching the surface of what's out there, so it's very important to do. And, and ultimately, you know, you're not going to be able to achieve this, this goal that I'm going to state because you're uh, this summer, because you're only here for two weeks. But ultimately, what you do your research on, whether it's a graduate student or a postdoc or a faculty member or a working scientist or engineer in the industry who's doing research, is you need to be the expert on your little narrow area of research. And you need to be broadly knowledgeable about other things, but what you're working on, you need to be, have expertise in. Um, you know, do not really miss the world. I think everybody knows about that. It's a little bit less relevant for you guys because. I'm not going to give you something to do that somebody did five years ago. And I'm not going to expect you to spend the next month figuring out what you should do. But ultimately, that's something you're going to have to concern yourself about. So the whole idea is to take what someone else has done or uncovered or discovered or published insights on and either take it to the next step or create something completely new based on those insights. Um, let me think of, of, of an example. Um, when I was a graduate student working on my dissertation, I was going in this direction. And I read a paper that I thought was peripheral to what I was doing. And it caused me to ask a question. And the reason I asked that question was I thought, I don't really understand this. And at some point, maybe in my doctoral defense, <coughs> somebody's going to ask me, and I, I don't want to stand up here and look dumb and not know. And, and answering that question ultimately changed my direction from this way to that way and led to I know, a dozen publications, my dissertation, and, and much funding. Uh, just because I read something somebody else did, it caused me to pose a question that I didn't know the answer to. My motivation was just not to look foolish, but the, the, the point was nobody knew the answer to this question. I just thought it was because I didn't know I didn't understand it. And there are many, many examples of where <coughs> reading something somebody else has done leads to new discoveries and ideas. Okay, this is probably the most boring part of the talk, not that any of it's exciting, and the most boring part uh, of research and scientific work, and engineering work and design, whatever you do, and that's documentation. Uh, nobody likes to do it, I don't like to do it either. Um, but it's very, very, very important. Again, if you don't document it, it's, it's almost a waste of time. So documentation primarily means you know, what you write in your lab notebook, or maybe you keep notes on your computer, um, but that documentation is very crucial. So uh, documentation of procedures and results is probably about one of the most important aspects of research. Because what do we do when we want to learn about something? We go to the literature. Well, where did the literature come from? It came from the results of other researchers, and they carefully and meticulously documented what they did when they wrote a paper on it, or a monograph, or a book, uh, or gave a talk on it. And so it's documented so other people can use it and build on it. But it's more than just that. That's the literature. A lot of the doc most of the documentation will be will never be published. Uh, you're writing what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, and you could spend 
you know, days and, and weeks, and at some point in your graduate career, maybe years, you know, working on things, and you may have several, you know, several notebooks filled with data, and at some point somebody like, like we just had to do, has to look at that notebook and, and, and try to reproduce it or build on it or understand what you've done. You may go back and look at something you did a year ago, and you need to, to build on that. And if you can't remember, you can't figure out what you did, and the details aren't there, you might have to do it all over again. So the idea is most of you probably, have most of you been given or told to use a notebook or write experiments out? I always give my students uh, you know, a notebook uh, at the beginning of the work and tell them to you know, document very carefully. So just a few things, you know, again, in the, uh, empirical uh, recommendations from you know, me and various people related to this program. So keep a very detailed but neat and organized lab notebook. And these are ideals. Uh, some people are better at it than others, but do your best to write legibly. That's kind of obvious, but a lot of times people don't write legibly. Uh, I don't have very good penmanship. That's why when I teach classes, I rarely write on the board. I only do that to answer a question or sketch something, but if, if, if I wrote all my notes on the board, it would just be a waste of time to come to my class, you couldn't read them. But when you're writing things in a notebook, you're not typically writing long essays that are pages long. You're writing a data point, writing a couple of sentences uh, to describe what you just did or some insights. Just try to do it as neatly as possible. And also, write it clearly. You may not be writing uh, an essay or writing something that's going to be published, but people need to be able to read it and understand what you're saying. Uh, you know, use dark writing utensils. Don't use pencil because they fade. Um, you know, some other sort of obvious boilerplate things. On, on every page, um, you should, and I'll be honest, I don't, I don't put my name on every page. I put my name on my notebook, and, and it's only mine, and so who else would be in there? But it's possible. I might hand my notebook to Daniel and say, for the next couple of days, I want you to do these measurements and you put them in my notebook. He should put his name on the pages where he's writing and put the date on there. So, you know, he did it and went. Um, you know, and, and other details. You know, what equipment did you use? What experimental conditions? You know, what procedure did you use? You know, what was the purpose? Why are you doing this? In, in one of the pages of, of the notebook, you know, in question that we looked at, I see a sketch and I see some numbers and I see a table and I have no clue well, I have some clue, but I don't really know what the student was trying to do. I don't know why this page exists. I can guess because I recognize the sketch of the sample, but I don't fully understand what the purpose of that page of notes was. Um, any interesting observations you made or thoughts or ideas. You know, occasionally you'll look at a result and you'll have a thought and say, you know, maybe this is what's going on. I wonder. Well, write that down because I guarantee you'll forget it tomorrow. I remember a couple of times, like walking down the sidewalk, I've had thoughts about something that I thought were kind of insightful and I wanted to pursue. I thought, as soon as I get back to my office, I'm going to write that down so I don't forget it. And a couple of times, I've forgotten to do that. And a month later, I, I vaguely remembered the thought, but it was gone. And, and in some cases, I was never able to retrieve it. So you know, write all this stuff down. It could be beneficial to you or to someone else. Just like the, the, the idea that I just said, I asked a question that led to going in a completely different search direction. I wrote that down in my notes, and I didn't pursue the answer for about a year. Because to me, it was just a question about something I don't know. If I thought about it and read a little bit more about it, the answer would be there, and that way I'd be safe, so I wouldn't look foolish if someone asked me. A year later, I came back, and I had pretty clear notes about what the question and confusion was, and otherwise I probably would have never pursued that avenue. Um, a good question to ask yourself is, uh, from your notebook, could someone else produce my work if all they had was my lab notebook? Could I reproduce my work six months from now? And if you did some elaborate experiment that took you about a week to do, and you write down notes, and in six months you need to go do it again, and you don't remember what you did, and you can't reproduce that from your notebook, then you, you've done a less than effective job of taking notes. It's not an easy thing to do, but you should always be asking yourself that. And as someone said, there's no su such thing as too much data. You can't write too much stuff in. If it's superfluous, then all you've done is wasted a little ink. If it's not enough, then you've wasted a lot more. So the, the lab notebook and all your documentation is very important. Here's a 
this is probably hard to see, but we sort of did the best we could. Here is two pages from two different notebooks. Um, and you know, you're writing in a lab notebook, it's not typed. But if you look at this page, look at it carefully, uh, the date is there, which is good. Um, I can't exactly even read that, but if I look closely, I recognize what that is. And so that's clear to me because I see this thing at least on a weekly basis. But if you were trying to reproduce this, does anybody know what that is? I know you do. Does anybody know what that's a sketch of? Have any clue what that is? Any thoughts or ideas or guesses? It's possible you, you may recognize that, maybe. Does that look a little bit familiar yeah. to you? Does that look familiar to you, Nathan? They know because they've seen some samples that look like this. Does anybody else even have a guess as to what that's a sketch of? Excuse me? A biochip? It's, it's, it's something related to that. It is a chip. But there ought to be enough notes there so you can figure that out. What that is, is a silicon wafer that's been cut into many squares. That particular silicon wafer has probably, um, let's see if it's on here. That's not even on there. Probably either 1,700 or 1,900 angstroms of silicon dioxide. Is that right? Is it one of those? those? Probably that's what it is, but it doesn't say. And those little, those little circles are aluminum dots that were evaporated through a shadow mask. And this is, is either has been or is going to be exposed to an ion beam. And the idea is the beam is going to have a beam diameter of about that. And those dots are going to be exposed and those aren't. Uh, and those structures form metal oxide semiconductor capacitors and blah, blah, blah. That's part of the research we're working on. The only reason I know that is I've been working on this for a couple of years and I recognize it. Um, but I still don't know exactly what this sample saw and exactly what all this means because it's just not that well documented. So probably these notes were written for the person who wrote them uh, and they might come back to it the next day and look at it, but it should be written such that somebody else is at least reasonably familiar with the work uh, can interpret what's going on. Now we look at this page. In this page, looks like there's a calculation. It's got a date, it's got a title. Flux and dosage with EBIT. You know, we, people are working in this area know, know what that means. And that's a fairly neat and organized set of calculations of trying to calculate those. And there's some bulleted comments down here. I haven't read them and you're not going to read them, but there's some ideas or some results. This is fairly easy to read. It's not jumbled all together and it's fairly organized and it's, it, it's carefully written. And so keep in mind when you're, you're read, uh, writing this stuff, it should be good enough that somebody else can read it and have a fair idea of what you're doing. I mean, obviously you don't want to, you know, you can overdo it. You've got to assume that the, that the people that are reading this uh, have some idea of, of, of what you're working on, but you still need to, to include all the details. More on effective documentation. Just a, a, a few thoughts from you know, label samples and data in an intuitive way. Uh, we've often had problems where we have so many samples with those little chips that come from different wafers that sell different materials and you put them in containers that are about that big. You need to label them so you know what they are, but you only have so much space. Uh, and and, and we try to come up with logical, effective ways you know, to label them uh, so we know what uh, you know exactly what they are. So you know, try to come up with ways to do that. Um, I think, you know, when I say I, and that's you asking yourself, if you're not available, did somebody else make the appropriate connections between your sample, the results, and experimental methods, or do they just see a box with some piece of material in there and they have no idea what it is? Also, a lot of times you, you have data files uh, on a computer, you make measurements, and maybe it's run by a computer and the files are You've got to get those file names, uh, make those file names logical. So. Be meticulous. Um, seemingly important details could be significant. It could, you know, plenty of stories where it leads to great insights and results, and, and uh, in other cases, it just allows you to figure out the solution to a problem. All kinds of factors can affect uh, your work, weather, humidity in the lab. Little minor, I put in quotes, minor details you think are minor can, can affect your experiment. And you probably won't know unless you can consult your notes. And, and this is more of a, a note to me. There's two stories I want, want to tell you about how important this can be. Uh, and, and the thing
thing is, is sometimes you'll write down these minor details and it won't ever lead to anything, but you just don't know, so you, you can't judge. The Dr. Poole story, that's a faculty member that's retired from here um, that I worked with a lot before he retired, and, and he told me a story when it happened of a grad student of his, and he was doing some work, and basically they were growing layers of dielectric on a silicon wafer, and they were using a different technique that was supposed to improve the properties. Um, and so they would compare the films with the standard uh, process to the new process and try to show uh, how it improved and why it improved. And so the new process was working pretty well, but what the student found was sometimes his samples worked really well and the leakage current, and the, these were insulating materials they shouldn't do that much, was really low and really good and better than most things that were being published. And other times they were really poor. The materials didn't adhere to the surface, they would rub off, uh, they had poor quality. And so he said, you must be doing something inconsistent and different. Fortunately, this guy was a meticulous note taker, and he went back and looked at what he did, and he said, I've, I've done them all the same. There isn't anything different. So he said, well, go back and look at every detail, like time of day, day of the week, anything, and see what, what the difference is. He couldn't see that he'd done anything different, and he repeated the experiments, and sometimes they worked, and sometimes they didn't. And finally, he noticed one thing. The, the end of the process um, required a triple rinse in deionized water. You take this sample of those little chips. And so he did a set of experiments and found out, sure enough, if you leave it in there too long, it degrades the material. So then the question was why, and they scoured the literature and found some paper back in the 80s where somebody found that with these certain class of materials, if you leave them in water too long, they absorb hydrogen, cause a reaction, go to the surface and reduce you know, the surface uh, uh, adhesion. And so if he hadn't written those seemingly meticulous notes down, I would have told him that it didn't matter how long he left it in the third beaker. We were all surprised, but it does. Another example, and I'm trying to go into so much uh, detail, but this is one that I think is the most fascinating one I've ever heard. Lithography, if you haven't heard of the term, is the method, an optical method uh, to image patterns on the integrated circuit chip. You look at a chip and you see all these, these geometric patterns of different colors. You get these patterns by doing this, this uh, lithographic step. And it's one of the things that limit you know, current technology and how deep you can make these things. And so it's a chemical process and an optical process. You coat a wafer with a photosensitive compound. You expose it uh, through a, in fact, some of you are probably working with Dr. Johnson, who's got this great optical photography stepper that the image of these materials, you expose it to UV light. It's a very complicated process and it produces these patterns. Well, this one lab found that um, when they um, inspected the lithographic image, that usually it was very, very good, but that sometimes it was very, very bad. So they tried to look at the list today and they found, you know, they, they fabricated seven days a week. On Thursdays, it was always bad. And every other day of the week, it was fine. So they thought, what can we do different on Thursdays? And they, did, they couldn't think of anything. Ultimately, after many, many you know, checks and, and balances and thinking about it, they realized that, that one of the air handlers that was in their lab was connected to the outside, and the location of the outside was right over the dumpster. And Thursday was garbage day. And when they pick up the dumpster, it threw all these tons and tons of particles all over the place and it fed back into the air ha handling system and came back down on their wafer. And, you know, they did some further experiments and that's exactly what it was. They moved the dumpster and the problem went away. So, strange things can happen. They thought it was something in their process, something in the chemicals, something in, in the optical photography stepper, maybe something the operator was doing, it was the garbage man. So, it's kind of funny, but it, it happened. And that was costing them tens of thousands of dollars a week in lost products. Meticulousness is important. I suppose you can carry it too far, but there's lots of gray areas in the world you just got to find them. More effective documentation. I didn't remember I had this in the papers. Um, this is a pretty good recommendation someone sent. Once you develop a format in your notebook, I never really thought about that. I'm not sure I have a format for my notebook, but it's probably a good idea to develop one, a style, and stick to it because then somebody trying to sit in your notebook can never be easy to find. Um, just some other hodgepodge of things. Um, 
you know, notes on how to run the equipment or maybe how you used it that day. You may be using it in a different way. Um, describe why you're running the experiment. Record the results of any analysis. You might write numbers down. You might sketch a graph. You might do some calculations. You might draw some conclusions. Write all that stuff down while it's fresh in your mind um, because you may forget it tomorrow uh, and do it clearly so other people can read it. You know, write down any thoughts that you have. Um, and one thing to keep in mind, this your lab notebook or your record, whether it's on a laptop or a real physical notebook, is really a journal um, or a diary, in a sense, of your work written for other people. It's not written for you. It's written for you, too, but it's written for other people, too, so you keep that in mind. Okay, that's a lot of, lot of talking. I'm still not done. If any comments or questions, anybody, interesting stories or thoughts you want to add before we go to the last couple of ideas? Okay. Learning and critical thinking. Um, so that's another idea that I've had more thought about in the this talk, is that, that it, it's important. And looking at some of the suggestions that, that people send us to include here, this is a good header for them to go under. Um, you know, you're doing more than making samples and taking data and recording it. If that's all you're doing, you're, you're basically working as a technician. And some of the work you do is like technician work. Um, when I worked uh, in, a, in a defense department lab before I came here, we were producing product in a lab, and I had technicians doing lots of routine measurements. But sometimes I did them because they weren't there or I wanted to you know, do, do things slightly different. Some of the work you do is at the technician level. Some of it's at the scientist level and everything in between. Um, but there's a lot more to what you're doing than just operating equipment and making samples and collecting data. That's important, but the, the hard part, the challenging part, and the part that takes a lot of education, experience, and training to do, and the fun and fulfilling part is taking those results and figuring out what they mean and doing something with it. In order to do that, um, you have to be expertise or an expert in your field and in related fields. Um, or at least you have to know something about those related fields. So just like I said, you know, do lots of literature review and continue, continually review the literature, you know, you want to learn as much as possible about your topic. So another thing you should do is, you know, not only review the literature, but you review your own notes, your own work, your own conclusions, what you did. Constantly go back and, and kind of review what you did. You know, you don't just write your notes down and then turn the page and never go back. I'm continually going back and looking at my notes and, and thinking about what I'm doing and where I'm going. And sometimes that causes me to slightly change what it, uh, the direction I'm going in. So constantly review yourself. Uh, discuss the work with your peers, you know, each other, grad students you're working with, faculty members, just people who are working along with you, because you can get a lot of useful ideas, you know, from, uh, from talking to other people. I've gotten many ideas talking to other faculty, especially this guy I mentioned in one of the examples, Dr. Poole. I would periodically just go sit down in his office and tell him what I was doing and just see what he thought about it. And oftentimes he would give me some good ideas. And oftentimes, just talking to him made me think about ideas. It's just a good thing to do. Again, do as much on, on your topic as possible. Journal papers, theses, textbooks. Um, you know, read stuff that's directly related to what you're doing and indirectly related to what you're doing, uh, because it can, it can be connected. It's a good idea, especially as your research career goes forward, to set a time to just read and collect literature. I put. I actually make a calendar every semester about what I'm going to do weekly and you know, set aside time for various things. And I set aside time to do this. The problem is that I oftentimes don't actually do it. There's always something that uh, gets in my way. But people that, again, there's somebody studying everything. People that study effective use of, of time you know, tell you that you ought to make this schedule. And unless there's an emergency, you do that. So if at 4 o'clock on Thursday I'm supposed to be looking at the literature, I should drop what I'm doing, unless it's an emergency, and do that no matter what. Even though I think, well, if I just had 15 more minutes, I could finish this task. It's probably some mundane task that's not that important. And I find myself falling into that trap. You know, you, you shouldn't do that. You should uh, 
uh, make sure that, that you sort of organize and plan your time and, and as much as possible use it. Um, and this, this is, a, is a good idea that you've got to be careful to take notes while you're reading material. There are so many papers out there, there's no way you're ever going to read any paper that's ever been written related to your topic. And some of them are very crucial, some of them are peripheral, some of them are irrelevant, some of them are core. So you don't want to do this with every paper you read. When I was first starting out in grad school, every paper I read, I read, I would read it as if I was going to have to take an exam on it the next day. And so I'd spend hours on it. And my advisor you know, told me, you're never going to get anywhere if you do that. Only do that on papers that are directly related to what you're doing, and you need to understand it in order to go forward. Mostly, you know, you can get a flavor for it. You read it, um, you know, maybe you'll write a sentence. Well, in this paper, these guys built this sample, and they did these measurements, and the results were that, you know, leaving the sample in a beaker of water longer degraded the performance. And you can write that in two sentences and pretty know what it is. Sometimes what you read might be completely irrelevant and you, you don't bother. But you've got to decide how important it is and taking some notes anywhere from just a comment to a page of notes uh, can be helpful in the general world, especially when you're writing a literature review. So it, you've, got to, you've got to be judicious in that. Sometimes you just need a flavor. There's some general gu guidelines that uh, people were sent. You know, some of these are, you know, pep talks, but they're important. You, know, you need to have a positive attitude, or at least try to. Sometimes you can't. But a lot of the work that you're going to do in scientific and technological and engineering research is tedious. Um, writing detailed notes in a lab notebook is not fun, but you need to do it. So just have a positive attitude that ultimately it's going to lead to something good. Um, you know, this is easier said than done, but you know, somebody spent a point and enjoy what you're working on. That's very important. Uh, if you enjoy what you're doing, it's not work. If you don't enjoy it, it's going to be difficult to maintain the necessary motivation because it's hard work. It takes a long time. You, know, you guys are here for 10 weeks, and 10 weeks is 10 weeks, but ultimately in your research career, it takes a long time, and there are lots of, you, know, you can spend day after day after day doing something, and nothing much comes of it. But sometimes it takes months you know, to, to get a result. Uh, if you can't enjoy it, I added this, a, fr a friend of mine pointed this out, if you can't enjoy it, perhaps you're in the wrong field. And if you hate it, there, there's a reason for that. Some people don't like research. It's, it's, it's not what they want to do. Other people do. And so one of the purposes of the RAU is for you to find that out. Hopefully you're going to find out that you love it and you join the grad school and do it. But if you find out you don't, then this is, this is the time to find out. Um, again, ask questions if you're unsure about anything, consult other experts, uh, talking with people is always good, you never be afraid to ask questions. Um, and sometimes it's good, you know, if, if one of you guys is working on some kind of solid state laser and the other of you is working on some kind of biochip and they're not related, but you're sitting over coffee talking about it, cross-fertilization of ideas can be a, you know, a very beneficial thing. Maybe some ideas that this person's using could be helpful in what you're doing, or at least stimulate your, your creativity. So um, it's always a good thing to do. Don't dismiss results because they're unexpected. Um, you know, I'll, I'll give my students uh, some materials or devices to make measurements on, and I'll say, this is what you should expect to see. If you don't see that, that doesn't mean, OK, well, the experiment went wrong, and it pitched this. Uh, there's lots of things it could mean. Um, but don't dismiss results because they're unexpected. Write them down, even if it looks like failure. Failure is not, if an experiment fails, it doesn't really fail, it means it didn't do what you expected it to do, and, and that, might be, that might be useful. Um, so obviously, never force or manipulate results to meet your needs. That's plagiarism, that will ruin a career. A whole underlying theme of science is deceiving that can make that happen. Um, a friend of mine, two friends of mine once were arguing about the way to set up an experiment. And finally, one of the guys said, the difference between you and me is you do an experiment to prove what you think is true. I do an experiment to find something out. And that's what experiments all do. What you find out may not be what you think it's what you think it's going to be. Okay to start with a hypothesis, but be open to finding out that that hypothesis isn't, isn't correct. There are a few final considerations. Um, this is a fancy way of saying summary conclusion. Several research techniques, experimental techniques, 
labs that need to be presented to help you facilitate quality research, and these are what some of those things are that are very important. Um, the practices we listed are fundamental in general for good research. It's not exhaustive. There's much more to be said, but it's sort of an introduction. And different labs, different areas of research will be different. People that are doing cancer research do a lot of different things than people that are doing laser research. Um, um, so these are general ideas we need to adapt them to their situation. Um, and this was an example of some here that I've already given. You know, the clean room, uh, clean room is very meticulous and very careful because it's complicated. There are dangerous chemicals that can hurt you or kill you. In the characterization lab, it's a lot safer and not quite. We have different protocols. So never stop asking peer review mentors for advice and input. Always good to ask questions. And so finally, but finally, I just want to say, if anybody have any questions, any ideas that you've learned or some common sense that we haven't mentioned or talked about or anything you want to discuss, any thoughts or ideas out there, even since you and Daniel, if you've got anything you want to say or add, what, what do you guys think? <laughs>